It's all about Jesus and the good things he's done. Go, oh, Jerry. So good to see everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's Tuesday, June the 28th, if I'm not mistaken. 28. 2022. My goodness, where's the year gone, wow. Jerry? Wow. It's it my is, birthday here for a long. I know it. It has flown by. Thank you for joining us on this summer night. You could be anywhere else, but you have chosen to be with us, and we really do seriously appreciate it. We appreciate Pastor Nate and Deliverance Revolution for allowing us to do some teaching through his ministry. We're going to finish up Romans chapter 13 tonight. We're going to start around uh, verse 11 or so, but Jerry's got a lot of scriptures. We're going to be jumping around a whole lot to support what's in those four little verses, and so uh keep up if you can if not get a pen and paper and write down the scriptures as we call out the location of the scriptures the added scriptures that we'll be uh referencing throughout the teaching <coughs> so let's open in prayer father i thank you Love for you, your father. word i thank Love you father you, that your word is truth Love you. your word is light your word is life to these mortal bodies it's life to our spirit without your word we would die so father we are going to take your word glean everything we can from it and we're going to hide it in our heart we will know your word without having the printed word so we will be prepared for the days ahead thank you father for these precious people open their ears to hear open their eyes to see what we don't even see open their <laughs> eyes to see what you want them to see in your word tonight we are not all knowing we are not in all this is not all that there is in these four little verses right so father we thank you for fresh revelation to johnny to wendy to marina to melissa we thank you father for re fresh revelation to barbara and charles and rosina and rb and to pastor nate and marty Give them all a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus' name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. I receive. Amen. So open your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. I'm going to read uh, these four verses in the New King James Version, and then we'll dissect them. And do this, verse 11, knowing the time that now it is high time, to awake out of sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Didn't notice that before, but he uses now twice in that one. It's now high time. Now our salvation, right now. Verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, drunkenness, lewdness, and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, for it fulfills to fulfill its lust. So this week I got to thinking about by, I believe by direction of the Holy Spirit to search out and understand when are we saved? When does salvation occur? What is my responsibility in my salvation? Are there actions required for my salvation? And how does my actions work toward my salvation? Are actions necessary? So, as we have studied through Romans so far, I recognize that I do have responsibility. The scripture says salvation is only by and through the finished work of Christ on the cross, our Lord and our God. 
We see that in Romans 10 and 9. Salvation is God's plan. The work to redeem us and our efforts to redeem us. It's, it's his plan. It's his work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all my works and all my efforts are hideous and putrid in God's sight. But do I have responsibility in my salvation? Let's turn back to Romans 10 and 9 and see what it says about salvation. Verse Romans 10, 9. Verse 10, verse 9 says, And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved and with the heart one believes into salvation and with the mouth confess confession is made unto salvation for the scripture says whoever believes on him will not be put to shame verse 13 whoever calls on the name of the lord shall be saved amen so i have responsibility i have to make a response to God's generous, gracious act of salvation to bring me in right standing with him. Now, as Barbara and I were talking about this lesson, Barbara made the comment that salvation is of God. Absolutely. It's his eternal plan. Mm -hmm. It was fashioned in eternity past before it says uh, that the lamb was slain before the foundations of the earth were established. We cannot save ourselves. Only God can. Can it? Can everybody hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. Okay. Uh, so in eternity past, God established salvation. It is his plan. It is his way. There's only one way to salvation, and that, that is through Jesus Christ. And this is a demonstration of his nature. This is his character. This is his personality. Just like salvation, God was, salvation was established in eternity past. It is today. And it forever shall be. Now we're going to see that. And we're going to talk about the progression of salvation. But how are actions involved in salvation? How are my actions? Mm -hmm. I understand that at salvation, there has to be a change of heart. They're not only a change of heart but a change of actions need to demonstrate that there has been a change of heart. And we call this change of action, repent, repentance, where you, you don't stop, but you turn and go a different way. You, your actions, the way you walk, the way you talk has to be evidence of salvation. But the actions, don't equate to your salvation. Right. Doing these actions doesn't secure your salvation. It only demonstrates that you are in right standing with God. Doing these actions does, however, enable you to get greater understanding and relationship with God. These actions. Because you get to know him better. You get to know him and you get to to grow in discipleship. And as you, Galatians 2, 20 and 21, as I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And as I walk this out, my relationship with him grows. And greater things are expected of me. Do my actions reflect the gratitude? My actions must reflect the gratitude that I feel in my heart toward the uncomprehensible cost of my redemption. I love the song that uh, we sing at church sometimes. How can I understand how much it costs to 
see mm-hmm. my sins upon the cross. Mm-hmm. What? Hallelujah. How much did it cost God to redeem me? Mm-hmm. How much did it cost Holy Spirit to redeem me? How much did what pain it he experienced? So are my actions involved in my salvation? Okay, write this down. John 14, 15 through 31. Johnny, you ain't writing. <laughs> John 14, 15 through 31. Barbara's going to read for us. All of it or just just 14, 14, I'll start at 14, no, 15. No, start at yeah, 14, 15. Of the gospel of John. Right. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Okay. So the verse verse 13 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 15. Verse, chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So this is an action that is necessary for us to demonstrate our gratitude of the price that God paid for us. James 3.13 says, action, wisdom acts out and shows demonstration of his actions. So, we going on and understanding salvation, the question, I came up with three questions about salvation. Am I saved? Yes, hallelujah. I am saved. Yes, hallelujah. I'm saved. I'm, am I saved right now? Yes. Hallelujah. Am, as if I go through Romans 10, 9 and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God hath raised, he is the son of God and God hath raised him from the dead. What does it say? I shall be saved. But am I saved? Yes. It says, the word says that I shall be saved. And it goes on a few few verses later, and it says, and you will be saved. I want to know, am I saved now? I don't want to (laughs) know if I'm going to be saved. I will be saved. I want to know that I'm saved right now. So I got to looking at that. And I found a biblical explanation that I am saved right now. Without works, without anything that I have done, Luke. 23 verse 40. You got that written down, Johnny? <laughs> All right. Luke 23 40. Am I reading that? I wish you would. All right. Just the one verse of four, through 43. We'll see. Okay. Luke 23 verse 40. And this was written in red, and this is the one of the, the last things that Jesus said. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> it's not boring. <laughs> Sorry. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Verse 43. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, right here, right now, you will be with me in paradise. Now, did he pay tithes? Did he get water baptized? Did he go to Sunday school? No, that day. He stopped breathing that day. And Jesus said right here today you will be with me in paradise. So let's go back to Romans. When you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe that God hath raised him from the dead, you are saved. But the word says, you shall be saved. So 
Are we saved or are we being saved? Yes. Yes, we're being saved. We are saved and we are being saved. Philippians 2, 12 through 18 says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. First Peter 2, 2, Thessalonians. Let's go back and make sure that we're reading this right. Reread re Romans 10, 9. Romans 10, 9. Are we saved? Are we being saved? Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, so we're being saved. We are saved. So when, when will we finally be saved? When will I know without a shadow of a doubt that I am saved? I know right now. But he keeps saying, I shall be saved. You will be saved. I found the scripture, Psalm 91, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It says, the last verse of Psalm 91, it says, and with a long life, I will satisfy him and then show him my salvation. That's a Jerry Seymour version. By looking for a different translation of the Bible, this is Jerry Seymour. Burton. So, when I am satisfied with life, when I am done, on that day, the Lord said, I will show him my salvation. After he is satisfied, then I will reveal to him the wonder and the completeness of my salvation. So when does that happen? Does that happen only when we die? Or how about when the rapture occurs, when we see him as he is and we are like him, then we will know the full completion of our salvation. I found this incredible scripture that validates this. It's in Isaiah 26, verse 19. Okay, so Isaiah is um, prophetic poetic and but just listen to this scripture as Barbara reads Isaiah 26 19. Barbara's getting her sword drill going. Yeah really 26 19. Your your dead shall live. That's right. Okay. Together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing you who dwell in dust. Mm -hmm. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Hallelujah. So we will live again. And at this point, Isaiah is prophesying that we will see our salvation. We will understand that the dead shall be raised, and we will live again. It's not only in the New Testament. It's the, the prophetic salvation and the deliverance from our dead bodies being raised again to live again is here demonstrated in Isaiah chapter 26. So, and this is also called the hope of our salvation. Right. The fact that we believe that Jesus, since Jesus was the first one raised from the dead, that we too will follow in like manner and be raised from the dead and live forever. That is what is called the hope of, of our salvation. salvation so um, you don't have that hope if you haven't been saved being saved and will be saved and believe that jesus has been raised from the dead yes unless you believe there's an empty tomb and understand that I, the cross the crucifix that we wear around our neck sometimes is not the end result he did die on a cross but he was buried and he was resurrected from that death. So we know him being the firstborn of the resurrected, we have hope for our salvation. Okay? So am I saved? Yes. Am I being saved? Yes. Will I be saved? Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. We I am 
I am being and I shall be. And I will see the wonder of God's complete salvation. So let's go back to Romans 13, verse 11. Now do this knowing that the time that now is the high time to awake from sleep for now our salvation is nearer than we first than when we first believed okay so you see that there is a progression we are closer now to our salvation we are closer we are in a greater covenant we have greater understanding we've been walking and experience the presence and the relationship with Jesus Christ, and we are experiencing salvation. Now, oh, I, I just thought that that was uh, an interesting sequence of events. But verse 11 says uh, in, in the Passion Translation, to live now is required that we be even more urgent for the time is running out and you know it is a strategic hour this is a strategic hour in human history the day it is time it is day and it is time for you to wake up our full salvation the final step of metamorphosis stepping out of and into perfect salvation wholeness is now nearer than when you first believed. Now that's a whole lot to understand, but we are in a metamorphosis process. We are being translated. We are uh, conform transforming and renewing our mind. So there is a growing process, but now is the time to wake up. Yeah, even New King James says the night is far spent. The day is at hand. The day is here. It's, this is it, folks. Today is the day of salvation. This is the time that we must get excited and energized and moving into the things of God. Because, verse 12, the night is over. The day is drawing near. Let us lay aside the, the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light now if you go back in my bible this paragraph starting at verse 11 says put on christ put on christ how do i put on christ what is he talking about what is he talking about what is this armor this light armor that he's talking about put on the armor of light man this really got I got fired up on this this week. Man, I have. Yeah, you did. Uh, and I'm, I'm fixing to give it to you. Y'all ready? Here we go. So, what is the armor of light? Man, I am really interested. So, Paul says here to put on Christ. What is he talking about? Is he talking about faking it till you make it? Is he talking about acting? Is he talking about just uh just striving and no i think he's talking about making a daily decision mm -hmm. to strip off the old way of doing things the old way of living according to our human desires and satisfying our own human desires and come before christ come before the father clean naked and transparent it reminds me of the scripture that Adam and Eve walked in the garden, wholly transparent, mm -hmm. without guilt or, with, or without shame. They were naked. That's the way we must come. We must come before Christ without shame or guilt or hindrances from the past. We must come before him and put on Christ, which must be clothe ourselves with christ that we might be prepared catch this for light duty now that's not what they put you on after you go back to work after an injury <laughs> light duty 
<laughs> no, we are to operate in the light, to live in the light as he is in the light. Yes, yes. So reflecting his light, his glory. But we must come before him transparent, not holding anything back that we might be clothed in his light. So I'm just gonna be real honest and transparent. The rest of this, I did not get on my own. I found it in a book. I went and searched and I found this, the rest of this teaching that I'm fixing to give you, uh, written back in 1700s, excuse me, the 1400s by a fellow called Matthew Henry. And you can read that in his commentary. So here we go. The first, we see four things going on that Paul tells us to do. The first thing we to do is wake up. Second thing to do is get dressed after you wake up. Not just wake up, but wake up out of sleep. <laughs> Next thing we do is we walk, we move. And then last of all, we make provisions for our day. We make provisions for this effort. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you read Romans uh, 13, 11 for us just one more time? One more time. Yeah. All right. Romans 13, 11. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to wake awake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed you're going to say something about waking up well you know we're we're living in a society where they're called you know it's woke people are woke to circumstances mm. well no this is not what this is talking about we the church has slumbered. The church has kind of been lulled in this nice little lullaby asleep. Easy grace. Restful, rest in Jesus. Some lullaby. You know, Let's be quiet. I, I, I think we are really, truly, some people prof who profess to be Christians are truly asleep no. in their relationship to jesus christ not wanting to offend anybody they, they may be out walking the streets they may be up going to church but they're really totally asleep in the spirit and unaware of what god is doing in the world today and doing in them mm -hmm. personally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so in the scripture in Romans 13, Paul is telling, wake, awake out of sleep. It is. When sleep in the New Testament was a oh, whole. Sleep in the New Testament was another word for dead. How many times did Jesus say, oh, they're not, they're not dead, they're just asleep? Oh. Hello. So. Paul Are we dead? in christ are we asleep or are we alive in christ so okay let's look at the look at the relationship of sleep here now sleep means not active in some form or fashion so if we are asleep in christ then we are either dead and waiting for the resurrection or not operating in our spirit man we are operating in our carnal security, our carnal way of doing things. We are being slothful of the things of God, neglectful of his will being performed in our life. But here, Paul asks and encourages us to wake up out of spiritual deadness. It's like being asleep on the job. How, how, how's that going to go for you? <laughs> Not so well. No. So the first thing we are to do is wake up. Okay? Reach over there and slap the alarm clock. It is time to wake up. The first thing we do in the morning, the alarm clock goes off, we wake up. Okay? The next thing we do, we wash our face, get ourselves rocking and rolling, 
get your coffee, jump in the shower. And the next thing we do is get dressed, right? Okay, let's see what he says. So when we are awake, we need to be active and excited and stirring around. The word of, of God, uh, Jesus commanded his disciples to stay awake, watch, be careful, be vigilant. And that was in the garden. Yes. So be ever watchful because there is Satan who roams around like a roaring lion who wants to devour, who wants to, de he's only killing, he only seeks to kill and destroy, steal, kill, and destroy. So we have to be on guard. We have to be awake and watch and conscious. Now, in Matthew 26, verse 36 through 46, 10 verses there, it describes the scene that we were just talking about Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And he tells his disciples to be watchful because of the hour. Mm -hmm. Was it the, the time of day? No, it was the events and the sequence that was going to happen that night. It wasn't simply the hour of 12 o'clock or one o'clock but be careful because of the events that are going on around you. But what did the disciples do? They laid back and fell asleep again. They went to sleep. Now, did the sleep disqualify them from being a disciple? No. They were all still disciples. Okay? But, Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. But, that the time, if it had not been for Jesus coming and waking them up the second or the third time, the Roman soldiers would have slipped in and woken up the disciples. Overtaken them. Right. But Jesus never slept. He never does sleep. And he awoke his disciples so that they were not caught unaware. Let us not be caught unaware. Let us awake and be stirring and excited about the things of God. What's the next thing that Paul says? Know the time. Consider, examine what time it is. It is high time. It is time to be busy because we have a great deal to do. Jesus has called us into the harvest. He has called us. The, what is the quality of the harvest? The quality of the harvest is indicative of the workers. How well the harvest is brought in. What the quantity of the harvest is indicative of the workers. God has called us. It is high time that we get up out of our sleep and be involved in the things of God. He's, Paul says here, knowing the time, consider that it is high time. It's time to be busy about the things of the Lord. Yeah. Recognize that we are in perilous times. Recognize that we that our, our testimony could be persecuted, but also be aware that the bridegroom is coming. We don't know the time. We don't know the hour. We don't know when Christ will return again. But Jesus promised us, when you see these things happening, look mm -hmm. up because your, your redemption, redemption draws, draws nigh. nigh. So our salvation, he says here in Romans uh, uh, 11, that our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. No, Romans 13. 13. 11. 13, 11. 11. What'd I say? 11. Okay. Romans 13, 11. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. So take up your profession, take up your job description and work in the Christian work. What is, are we called Christians? 
we need to start acting like we're Christians. We, we say we're Christians, but we're not performing the job description that, that we profess. Just do what you say you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The eternal happiness, the eternal reward that is given to us is based upon our works. Your works will be tried. Your works will be tried with fire. Those works that endure the fire will be rewarded and you will be able then to give a, a crown of righteousness to lay at Jesus' feet. Back to the crucifixion. The guy that went to heaven was in paradise with Jesus, had no reward, had no crown to lay at Jesus' feet. Here we have opportunity to work in the harvest that we might have a crown to lay at Jesus' feet. We can't do that if we're slothful, lazy, and sleeping. We have to work in the field to bring in the harvest, the harvest of souls. One of the things that just came to mind, and not that I need this group in this Zoom class to be bigger for my own feel good. That's not why I'm saying this. I'm saying this as part of your job description. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying part of your job description. If you have a hard time sharing the gospel with your coworkers or someone on the street or your friends that you've known a long time, a great way to, to simply do to share the gospel with them is simply invite them to the Zoom class. All you guys know somebody right. that could benefit from this. Just simply invite them. That is part of our the work of the ministry. Mm -hmm. That's part of bearing the armor of light. Don't keep this to yourself. Not that we're so great and wonderful, but the word is great and wonderful. Amen. And so part of what, with that, he didn't say this and we didn't pre-talk about this, but it's a great example. It's a great way to share the gospel with people you know, share the gospel with people that can't get out and go to church. They might still be afraid of, oh, they might be homebound. There might be a lot of things. They might not have a good church to go to, close to them. But this is a great opportunity to invite people you know in your community and in your family and in your sphere of influence because those are the ones we're responsible Absolute. for. Those that we have. Those been. are the ones we're responsible for. Right. The people that we have relationship with, right. our sphere of influence. So invite them, encourage them to come and join you. Look, let's go to a Bible study together. Then we can talk about it during the week. Right, right. That's part of your Christian work, Christian walk. That Jerry's encouraging us to get involved in and to wake up. We cannot keep this God that we know and love and what Jesus has done for us. We cannot keep it to ourselves. Okay. We cannot. So oh, we must we know, must know the time. We must know the season. We must recognize that we're in perilous times. And the scripture that I quoted was Luke 21, verse 28. Now, when you see these things begin to happen, this is Jesus saying, now, when you see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your head because your redemption draws nigh. Like our salvation, we're talking about, are we saved? Will we be saved? When will we finally be saved? We will finally be saved when we see him as, and we will be with him and be, oh, as he is. There we go. I got it. Oh, after we hit the alarm clock, we wash our face, we get our coffee. The next thing we do is we get dressed, right? We don't go out wearing our pajamas. It so pains me to see folks in, in the grocery store wearing their pajamas and slippers. My goodness. <laughs> Make yourself presentable. That just... Oh, I'm going to wear that to church Sunday morning now that you told me that. <laughs> so how do we dress ourselves? How do we spiritually dress ourselves? We cannot go out 
in public wearing our pajamas. We must cast off the results of our past deeds that we have done in darkness. We take those garments off. We take off that wrap. We take off the wrappings of our sinful works in darkness. We take off ignorance. We take off mistakes. We take off the fulfilling of our own desires because, oh. because fulfilling That's our own, own desires will only lead us to the darkness of hell and destructions. Mm -hmm. They that fulfill their own desires. There is a way that seems right unto men, but the way of that leads to destruction. That's good preaching. So let us therefore, who are of the day, cast off these actions, not only cease from the practice of them, but detest and abhor them and have no more to do with them because eternity is just at the door. Let us take heed lest we, find, well, lest we be found doing that which will result against us. At Second Peter 3, 11 and 14. We must cast off the works of our flesh in order that we might put on Christ. We're getting to this armor, folks. We want to put on the armor of light. Revelation 3.17 says, you got it there? I do. Please yes. Read. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have needed nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Put off. Go on. Mm -hmm. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich in white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So he's telling us here to put off the old deeds and put on Christ. Put on that we might be through the test of time through the test and, and the careful scrutiny when we stand before the righteous judge of the universe and he evaluates our deeds, how will they be proven by fire? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Will we be found wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, or will we be clothed as we have put on Christ? So, it's time to start selecting your clothes, folks. Sometimes it takes Barbara a little bit longer than me, but she always comes out very pretty. I have more to choose from. Oh, she's got a lot more to choose from. <clears throat> and I like to wear the same ones over and over. Yeah, but you do. <laughs> we must put on, we must clothe, catch this. We must clothe our soul. We must decide by the training and the transformation of the way we think and clothe our soul and train our soul that we might have eternal destiny and determine what our destiny we will be and how are we gonna show up there? Are we gonna show up there like the thief on the cross who had no reward? Are we going to have those that come with us? And we hear him say, well done thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things now enter into the joys that i've prepared for you that ain't in my notes but that's good preaching right there that is we want to have a reward that we might lay down at his feet gratitude and show by our actions how greatly we appreciate his salvation in our lives we are to put on the armor of light we are to Lay down, that's the next thing. We are to select and decide that we are going to wear the armor of light. We lay aside those old practices of sin. We lay aside its wrappings and we clothe ourselves appropriately. We don't choose cotton or silk 
or even fine leather, which would represent the skins of dead animals. No, we clothe ourselves appropriately for the job at hand. We talked about the job description that we had talked about before. Our job is disciples of Christ. Christians carrying on the mission that he, he has put at our feet. Christians are soldiers in the midst of enemy. We have a life of warfare, but we have an array of armor that we can stand in defense and we can actually wear the armor of God. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Let's see what that armor of God looks like. Turn to Ephesians 6, 13. Ephesians 6, verse 13 says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Who's whose armor? God's armor. The armor of God. But not just a few pieces. No. Paul doesn't tell us, just, oh, just take up just the helmet. Or oh, just the breastplate. Just the breastplate or just the belt. No. Take up the whole armor of God. Okay, hang on. You wouldn't show up to work with just your socks on. You wouldn't show up with just your socks and your t-shirt. No, you get fully clothed to go to work. And you certainly would get fully clothed to go to battle. Yeah, can you imagine a soldier out on the battlefield with with no shirt or no boots on? Mm, I think they'd send them back to mm. the to the barracks, barracks to finish getting dressed. Okay. We are in that type of war. So this is the armor of light, by the way. This is the armor of light. That that's right, because God is light. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. In that day, right today, today. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your having girded your waist with truth, mm -hmm. having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Right. And don't just take it up, but pray. It goes on to say, with all prayer and supplications. With all perseverance for all the saints. Amen. So we've got to learn our armor. We've got to learn what it means, how to operate in this armor, because God has given us his armor. And there's never been a, a time that Satan was not defeated when he faced the armor of God and the word of God came out of that armor. Every time Satan was defeated. Yes. Every time. It doesn't matter who's in the armor. You see, in Judges chapter 6, verse 34, it says, and Gideon being clothed with the Holy Spirit went forward and did mighty deeds. It says, even in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came on the judges and they did, they performed mighty deeds of God. That's in the Amplified Bible, Judges chapter six, verse 34. So we must be clothed with the armor of God, not only clothed, but skillfully reeling the sword of the spirit skillfully which stand, is the word skillfully standing now these skills are the graces of the holy spirit there are skills that are graces of the holy spirit that we might walk the way he walked and these we are able to secure our soul against satan's temptations and his assault in today's world this is the armor some think that this armor that paul was talking about here he used and and used the metaphor of the the roman soldier not as their daily 
armor, but their brilliant shining armor that they wore into battle. It is a very picturesque and beautiful suit of clothing. This must be our daily wear. This, as we recognize that we're in war, we must suit up for our job description every day. Amen. And these, this armor is a costly and it is priceless. It is precious and it's given to us with great effort through God that we might be clothed with Christ because we recognize that it comes first of all through salvation. Put on Christ, verse 14. Put on Christ Jesus, our Lord. This stands in direct opposition. We see that we will no longer fulfill the lust and desires of our flesh. Verse 14. Can you read verse 14 for us? Yes, you just about read it already. But it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. So what's the last thing you do after you leave the house? You get all ready, you got your coffee, you're heading out the door, you got your uh, snack. You make provision for the rest of the day. Make sure you got us old folks, glasses, phone, car keys, and wallet. Some, and, okay. And <laughs> something to eat. And something to eat. That's right. To make it through the day. Well, Paul says, make no provision for the flesh. This is a sure way to fall. We make provisions, but we make no provision to the flesh. We walk soberly in, in, in the virtues of God without uh, uh, rioting or drunkenness. No, we cast off these things and put on the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus that we might be justified and found in right standing with him. He goes on in, uh, to say that we can put on the priestly robes of our elder brother. We can put on the spirit and grace of Christ through sanctification and put on the new man, which is in Ephesians 4.24. Get in the habit of, of grace conforming with the quick actions of obedience. Christ is the best clothing a Christian can uh, adorn himself with, arm himself with the Holy Spirit. Decent, particular, peculiar, mm -hmm. distinguished, mm -hmm. unique in the light of the world. Without Christ, we stand naked. We stand vulnerable. We st you know, being, being peculiar, it was in, when Jerry was working his corporate job at the hospital he would get dressed in the morning go to the hospital change clothes into scrubs change clothes out of scrubs in the afternoon when he was done with the shift put his street clothes back on and come home and then change clothes again to go out to the yard or the shop or whatever to cut grass well to be peculiar and not necessarily to stand out but there are, your clothes say something about you. Right. If, if you, you are perceived street, as you, you are received as you are perceived. Say that again. I, I, you are received as you are perceived. It's hard to make a second first impression. Yeah. So Jerry got this idea of 20 years ago, probably, when you started doing it. Mm -hmm. He goes, I've got all these clothes in my closet. I've paid good money for these dress pants, these collared shirts, these dress shirts. I am going to quit wearing what he was wearing at the time, just -shirt. blue jeans and t-shirts to work. That's what everybody else was. That's what everybody else was. Well, because you had to change clothes. Yeah. He goes, it doesn't take any more time to put on a pair of dress pants and a collared shirt than it does put on a pair of blue jeans and a t-shirt. So he started going to work every day to the hospital where no, I mean, and you walk from the parking lot to the department on the first floor and change clothes again. Right. But he started doing this. And you know what people started doing? Are you a doctor? No. 
I'm not a doctor. Are you a doctor? Oh, you must be. Are you an administrator? He was perceived greater than he was. And, you know, Jesus wants us to be perceived by the world, not as just another person in the world. You're preaching. Yes, we need to be able to fit into a situation and relate and relate to people but on a regular basis we sh we need to represent jesus christ to the best of our ability and in, in our conviction now this is just our conviction okay old time but in our conviction you give god your best even in your dress even now you don't stick out like a sore thumb, but just walking in a authority, mm -hmm. walking like you are somebody mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. because you are people, you are important. Right. You are important to the kingdom. You are important to th those who love you. You are important to this ministry. You're important to God and giving him even your best and not only your dress for the spiritual warfare, but your dress in your natural life to be received as you want to be, to be perceived as you want to be received. received. So how are we received? Uh, First Peter 3.15 says we are baptized with Christ and into this experience. Galatians 326 talks about being baptized into Christ. So we are brought in to Christ in our profession and our baptism. So we need to walk like he walked, talk like he talked, and then we will see results that he said. Therefore, submit yourselves to God, to his rule, as Jesus has saved you. He has saved you. You have been anointed by the Father and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So walk and rule and operate in authority. This is how we clothe ourselves with Christ, putting him on, not only by what we say, but what we do. We are clothed and get this, we are possessed by God. Now, Satan only imitates. He only counterfeits what is precious to God. If Satan can possess, how much more can God possess? Let us be possessed by God. Let us be wrapped up. Let us walk in the power of Christ. So when we wake up, when we get up, when we wash our face, when we dress, we don't just sit down. No, we go to work. We don't sit like monks or hermits. No, we present ourselves to God. We present ourselves to work. We walk honestly, as in the light, Ephesians 5, 8. We are children of the light. Our confession must be ordered by the Holy Spirit and the gospel. Walking honestly as a credit to your profession. Do you call yourself a Christian? Let your walk be evidence of your profession. Christians should walk in a special manner, careful to conduct themselves because people are watching. We must understand that oftentimes we're the only Bible that some people read. We are the only Bible, the Hebrews 13, 18. We must walk accountable. Lord knows, we've been getting good teaching and we must be accountable to the teaching and the understanding that we receive. We must make provisions, not for our flesh, but we must be careful to take care of those things that are necessary. We must take care of our body. Yes, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We make provisions for our body. We go, we understand that our, we are the light of the world, but this light's got to have some oil in it. We've got to spend time in his presence. We have to spend time. We have to take care of our body. 
but we don't make provisions for our lustful desires. Right. We put aside those, yes, we can eat meat, but we don't eat and fulfill the desires of our flesh. We fulfill the desires and the needs of our body. Those who profess to walk in the spirit must not fulfill the lustful desires of their flesh. Galatians 5, 16. We must understand that we have the opportunity and the responsibility to walk out our salvation, to live in a way that demonstrates that we are saved, mm -hmm. that we are being saved, mm -hmm. and that we shall see the full fulfillment of our salvation according to his work. The way that we walk out our salvation is by walking in the light of the gospel and walking in the armor of light, which is Jesus Christ, that we might put on the armor of God. What a compliment that we might have the armor of God that never fails. Yes. When we walk as Jesus walked, only doing what he saw his father do, only saying what he heard his father do, with the armor of God, we cannot fail. We stand, we fight, and we will succeed. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have called us to walk. You've called us to walk, not sit still, not lay down, not roll over and play dead. You've called us to get up and walk. In a few weeks, we'll even learn that you've called us to run. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to start with walking, Lord. And standing. And standing. We bless you and we thank you for your word. May it find good soil to find good root to grow and produce an abundant harvest. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Thanks, guys. Good job. Everybody give Barbara and Jerry a hand. It's hard work preparing for a Bible study. I don't know if it's hard work, but it's certainly intense work. Um, if you're watching this video still and you have questions or want to contact us or want to join this group, please go to deliverancerevolution.org to contact us, but we'll be glad to respond to you. That's deliverancerevolution.org. And we'll send you an invitation to join this group. Also, there's a link on there for prayers. deliverancerevolution.org. Click the prayers link. There's a lot of good prayers if you got questions. So Barbara and Jerry, or anything related to Jesus, we'll be glad to answer it. And we ask that you would like to invite you to attend every Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. God bless you. We thank you for coming. And we will see you next week. It's all about Jesus and the good things he's done. Flame wide. Let's see his kingdom come.